Hello, we're back with another exciting edition of me giving you notes. Wow. Exciting. Well, at least you can pause me. <laughs> so right now we've kind of talked about like an introduction and sustainability. We're moving into earth systems and processes. So we've looked at um, global air currents and water and ocean currents. We've looked at the uneven heating of earth and how that's affected and does affect our climate. Weather, which is localized day-to-day -day stuff um, in the atmosphere. Um, overall, like um, air currents that go through the troposphere and then air currents that pass over the surface, like in an east-west kind of direction, um, and ocean currents. So hopefully you have kind of a decent understanding of that because we're going to be talking about literally like the opposite of air, which is Earth. Wow. Okay, so let's look for a minute about um, Earth's major geological processes and hazards. So this is from your book, the digital one. Dynamic processes move matter within the Earth and on the surface and can cause volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunamis, erosion, landslides. That's exciting. Um, weather can be really exciting. You can have hurricanes like El Nino is even like interesting, like how it causes different things to happen all over the earth. Science is interesting. And you can like explain so many things that go on. If you're like, why does this happen? Someone's probably asked that and has answered it. If nobody has asked it and answered it, then you can try to do that. That's why I love science. Okay, so so let's take a look here. So Earth is a dynamic. So dynamic means changing. Um, a dynamic planet. And you think, well, is it though? Like it's kind of a ball in space. Yeah, it's not going to become like a pyramid or something. But the surface of the Earth is changing constantly. Um, it's just changing slowly compared to our human lives. Like we're like a flash on, on in the surface of the Earth and compared to the age of the Earth. We're nothing. Um, the Earth's been around 4.6 billion years. We, I mean, maybe we'll live to be 100. That's nothing. Okay, even all of human history, if you consider humans being around for about a million years, that's nothing. To, to 4.6 billion, that's nothing. Okay, if, if the Earth, the age of the Earth was like a school day, we would show up at, and that went from 8 to 3, Human life would show up on that scale at like 259 and like 58 seconds or 59 seconds. So we've been around for like no time at all. That's why it doesn't seem to us like Earth is changing or moving or doing anything. Because our lives just are not long compared to the age of the Earth. So let's talk about geology. Um, don't watch South Park. It's bad. I think I'm supposed to say stuff like that. Um, but anytime I hear geology, I just think of Stan's dad from South Park, just in a dramatic moment, he's always like, step back. I'm a geologist, you know, as though, as though that means anything. But what is geology? Um, geology is the study of like rocks, minerals, processes that go on in earth. Um, so they look at the dynamic processes that go on on earth's surface and below the surface in earth's interior. Um, so there's three major like zones or layers of the earth, the core, which when you're in like sixth grade, maybe eighth grade too, I remember teaching this to sixth grade, you learn the inner core, outer core. Um, so there's kind of two cores, okay. The core, the mantle, which includes the asthenosphere, um, and the crust, which is made up of continental crust and oceanic crust. Most of the crust of earth is oceanic because... Most of Earth is covered by oceans. So um, the crust and the very top part of the mantle are also known as the lithosphere. It's, I don't have a lisp. It's lithosphere. Lithosphere. Maybe I do. Um, and then the rest of the mantle is called the asthenosphere. So let's take a look. There's a lot of different features that make up Earth's crust and upper mantle. Um, 
And like there could be potentially features in the inner and outer core, but we can't see them. We can't drill down to them. In fact, I'm not even sure if we've been able to drill deep enough to sample the mantle. We might have in like a deep ocean area. You remind me to look it up. Okay, but um, look at some like features, volcanoes and mountains and mountain chains. Um, here's our continental crust. You can see they kind of color it a little bit different than um, an oceanic crust. Um, so then we've got our continental shelf that kind of extends out into the continental slope and rise. That's like if you were going out into the ocean, it's sort of like how it like slowly gets deeper and deeper. Um, the way deep part of the ocean can be called the abyssal plain. That sounds scary for, you know, a weekday. Um, there are trenches, so that's sort of like um, like a deep area, like the, the Marianas Trench, for example. Um, and trenches will form where you have two plates. We'll get to really what plates are in a little bit, but like this ocean crust and this continent crust where they kind of come together. Um, this little area, I'll, I'll tell you later, is called a subduction zone. And to like subduct is to like go below. So do you see how the oceanic crust is sort of going below the continent crust? And then you can have like... Um, an oceanic ridge. Okay, so a mid-ocean ridge is where you can form new crust. So the mantle here has these convection currents, just like there are currents in the ocean, just like there are currents in the atmosphere, the mantle has a current. Okay, so it's going to heat up, rise, cool, and sink, and get heated up again. This makes me think back to when I first started teaching. I promised promised my sixth graders I would bring into them a lava lamp to illustrate this convection current. And I never did for two years that I had them. If any of them ever see this, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry I never brought it in. I don't know why I kept forgetting. But if you have a lava lamp, you can see like how convection currents work in the mantle and in the air and in the ocean. Um, because in a lava lamp, you have the light bulb at the bottom. It'll heat up the lava and the lava will rise up cool near the top and sink back down and then you get that cool lava lamp looking thing don't leave it on for too long because then it all sticks to the top because everything got really hot anyway so this part of the mantle is very 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 hot and is rising up and it's so hot it pushes up through the crust breaks the crust here and like kind of can come out as um as lava Okay, so it's um, actually forming new crust, new ocean crust right here. So new earth is made right here. And the older crust is here. Oop, it got pushed down. That's, that's older. So here's just another look at that. If you want to pause and take a look, it's also in your notes, but if you want to see it a little bit better. Um, oh, yeah, one thing I want to point on here. So the crust is this thin area. I know this gray part is a little bit thicker. And this brown part is part of that mantle, the second layer, not the crust. But it's a little bit different. It's a little bit harder, um, and not, but it's not quite crust. Um, so this upper part of the mantle and the crust is known as the lithosphere. The rest of the mantle that's more plastic and movable um, is called the asthenosphere. So just, just letting you know about that. So the Earth's moving underneath you right now. I mean, we're basically hurtling through space at hundreds and hundreds of miles per hour. I mean, we're rotating counterclockwise every day. It's literally happening right now. And then we're revolving around the sun. And then the whole solar system is flying through space. So, I mean, yeah, we're moving. But not only that, the Earth's crust is moving underneath us right now. Um, and like I pointed out in that last picture, the mantle has convection cells or convection currents, just like in the ocean and just like those like Hadley and Farrell cells in the atmosphere that rise, cool, and sink. Okay, so because it's a current, um, it's, it's moving. Okay, so the lithosphere, that top layer of the mantle and the crust, they're on top of this current. So what do you think is happening? Well, the current might be slow, and the, these things are huge and heavy, but they are moving. So the lithosphere is moving on top of the asthenosphere. The lithosphere 
is also not just one big piece. So the crust isn't just one big piece around the earth like a, oh, like one of those lint truffles. And then on the inside, it's like the liquidy, delicious chocolate. Oh, never mind. Um, but it's not like that, okay, because that's one solid piece of chocolate. It's more like like a crumbly crust, like, like um, I don't know, like if you, like, cut a pie and like the top crust kind of just breaks into pieces when you try to cut it. That's what the lithosphere is like. It's like a bunch of pieces. Pieces tectonic plates. And that's why the study of the movement of these plates is called plate tectonics. That works out kind of nice. All right. So I'm sure you've heard about this before either in Gosh, I, I want to say 8th grade, 6th grade, so it might have been a little while. But you've probably heard about these plates moving, excuse me, on the surface of the earth. They're moving, they're part of the surface of the earth. They're moving on top of the asthenosphere, on top of those currents in the mantle. <clears throat> so these plates can behave in a, in a variety of different ways. They can be divergent. And I think of the book with the girl and she didn't fit anywhere. So divergent boundaries, if you think of, oh, I won't use pink because pink is not my favorite color. I'll use my favorite color, green. Um, so you can think of these as these plates. So a divergent boundary would be when these plates are moving away from each other. That would be like in the um, picture that I showed you where there's that mid-ocean ridge or an ocean ridge. And magma. So, I mean, there's not a spot on Earth where, like, there's nothing or, like, you know, the eye appearing underneath of, like, whatever sort of sea monster. Well, what's underneath there? The mantle. So that mantle can rise up between those plates and will form into new crust, new oceanic crust. So um, magma will come up to the surface and, and form new crust. Then you have the opposite. You have convergent boundaries. And if you converge on an idea, it means you come together. So if I push these two plates together, of course it doesn't want to work super well now, um, they will push up against each other. So you can have, if these are two continental crusts, they will form a mountain. You can see when I was doing it before and I tried to do it, like one, one wants to go underneath the other, okay? No matter what I try to do, one's going to, it doesn't want to make a mountain too well. Well, so what's it called? That happens too. Um, when ocean crust will hit continental crust, um, the oceanic crust will go underneath the continent crust. That's called a subduction zone. And there you'll find earthquakes and volcanoes um, because there's a lot of um, like scraping and heat and stuff generated there. You can also find a trench in the ocean. Um, then you have transform boundaries. And a transform boundary would be like, when two plates um, slide past one another like this, okay? So you can imagine if these two plates are jammed up against each other and I'm pressing my hands together and one tries to slide up, it's going to cause like a sudden movement, um, an earthquake. And the, the most talked about transform boundary is the San Andreas Fault, which runs through San Andreas, California. A lot of people are like, oh yeah, that's why all of California is going to go into the ocean. That's not how it works. Okay, it's not like it's not like here's here's California and it can just crack off and sink. It's not like we live in Final Fantasy world or something like where it's like on like a, like the island's floating. It's connected all the way down. Like so, if you went down off the coast of California and could just go down, down, down. Well, all that continent is connected. It's connected to that one giant piece of lithosphere, but. A very small portion of the land of California near San Andreas is um, on this fault line. And so this transform boundary is actually pushing that little like western part. It's actually going north. So California is not going to end up hanging out with Hawaii. It's slowly being pushed more and more north um, as time goes on. Um, but that, that takes thousands and thousands of years for things like that to like have a really noticeable change. So let me see if I have this picture again. Oh yeah. 
So I like this word too, that it's made of a, a mosaic of huge rigid plates that, that are called tectonic plates. I just like the word when they use the word mosaic. So think of like, you know, those, um, it's not a painting. They're, they'll do it with like little stones or think of like a stained glass window where they have a bunch of little pieces of glass that make up a picture, a bunch of little stones that make up a picture. That's like a mosaic. Well, earth is made of a mosaic of these tectonic plates. So you have many of these humongous plates covering the earth. And some are disappearing, some are growing, and some are disappearing because they're being subducted under each other until eventually it's going to be gone. Um, so you'll see some smaller plates um, when you look at um, a map of all of the tectonic plates of Earth. So what is driving all of this? Heat, heat energy, and this time it's not from the sun. It comes from the core of the Earth. So the inner and outer core are very, very, very hot. And they heat up this material that we call the mantle. Okay, the mantle you can you can think of is like magma and stuff. Okay, but so it's heating up this material in the mantle. So just the way convection works, convection heating, convection currents, things will heat up, rise. Okay, things that are hot will tend to rise, cool, and sink back down to be heated up again. It causes a current to form. So when these currents are, you get general movements of plates. So take a look at the current going this way. Okay, this particular current's going this way. Well, we have a plate that's going to move this way. Okay, so the currents drive which direction the plates will move. Um, and that will cause the, the surface of the Earth to change over time. I'm sure if you remember anything uh, about learning about dinosaurs and stuff, they talk about Pangaea and how there was a large supercontinent on Earth at one point in time. Well, that's because like many of the continental crust portions were kind of together and over time as the earth changes that big pangea broke up pangea means all earth by the way and changed and the landforms have moved into what we have today um i'll see if i can find one in the future and show it to you but they make um estimates about what will happen in the future and how um plates are going to look in the future it was my phone by the way it definitely scared me sorry um, so because of this movement, we get movement of plates. Because of the movement of the plates and them subducting under each other or pushing on each other, we get um, surface formations on Earth and we get um, some different things happening on Earth. For example, when plates will move fully um, and kind of crash into each other, you can get an earthquake. Or when they slide past each other, like if they're like, imagine they're stuck and they slide. That's an earthquake. Um, where you have this subduction zone, um, it will push up some very, very hot um, magma, liquid hot magma, in fact, um, all the way up and form volcanoes. So this would kind of bubble up on the surface, but over hundreds and thousands of years, those that layer of magma has stacked and stacked and stacked and it looks like a mountain we call it a volcano um then we can get mountain ranges when you have continental crush smashing into each other you can get mid-ocean ridges where you have these convection currents pushing things apart um, and that's where you get the formation of new crust so it's all driven by heat from the inner core heating up the mantle and causing these convection currents to, to form. So here's a map of all of our tectonic plates. Like there's this uh, Juan de Fuca plate is disappearing because it's being subducted. Soon it's going to be gone. Um, same thing with the, um, the Cocos plate is probably going to be gone or the Caribbean plate at some point in time will be gone. So there might have been other plates at some point in time that have been subducted and are just gone because of what's happening. Um, here, this is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is where new oceanic crust is being formed. So if new ocean crust is forming, this plate, North American plate, is going that way, and then the um, plates on this side are going this way, like the Eurasian and African plates are going this way. So eventually, there's going to be more distance between North America and Europe, or North America and Africa, these things move at a very slow rate, okay? A couple of inches per year. I have to actually look because I don't remember, okay? So what's nice about this, it also shows you divergent boundaries. That means where the plates are moving away from each other. 
Um, and then you have convergent boundaries where the plates are coming together. So I want to just draw your attention right here to the um, India plate and the Eurasian plate. Um, these plates have been crashing into each other, and that is formed and is currently forming the Himalayan mountains. So um, India here used to kind of be on its own, and these plates moved and moved and moved until they crashed into each other, forcing themselves upward and forming that mountain range. Here's just another um, closer up view of that. And you can pause and take a look at it. So this is an actual look at that San Andreas Fault. Remember, this is a transform boundary. The plates are not going into each other. They're not moving away from each other. They're sliding past each other. So one is going north, the other is going south. Um, and this is an actual kind of view of literally where the plate is um, in this Carrizo Plain in California. So some, some fault lines are very obvious, and you can see them. Some are not. Like the Mid-Ocean Ridge, you can see it. Like you can, you can literally map it. Okay, so um, do I want to talk about weathering and erosion right now? Not, not yet. I'll come back and, and talk about weathering and erosion a little bit later. Uh, okay, I lied. Uh, let, me, let me just mention it now, and then we can always talk about it more later. So the, the geological processes I talked about, like the movement of plates and the convection currents with the mantle coming up, they're going to build Earth up, form mountains, form new crust. Um, if there's a hot spot in the mantle, it can form an island in the middle of the ocean, like Hawaii. So they're going to build up the Earth. And then there's external geological processes, which we call weathering, that are going to break the Earth's surface down. So um, weathering can be physical, chemical, or biological. Um, and you have erosion, which is movement of all these things. So physical weathering could be um, like a, a river flowing over rock and forming a canyon. Chemical could be like, um, oh, with acid rain, you can have chemical weathering. It will slowly break down rock. And biological, you have plants that are going to break down or moss that's going to break down rock and form soil. And then erosion is the movement of weathered stuff. So erosion oftentimes happens with weathering. So like wind can actually weather rock. Okay, so if you have constant winds, if you look at any of the pictures of those beautiful national parks in the American Southwest, like Roadrunner and Coyote areas, um, a lot of that, those beautiful rock formations are, were formed by wind. So the wind carved the rock, but then will blow the dust away. So the wind blowing and wearing down the rock is weathering. The wind picking up and moving the dust and sand is erosion. So the water cutting through and forming the canyon is weathering. Water moving sediment and soil and um, pebbles and rocks is erosion. Okay, so um, glaciers are huge. Um, they do weathering and erosion. Um, we'll, we'll, we can get into all these in detail later. Okay. So let's talk about volcanoes, because that's cool and dramatic. Um, they release molten rock from Earth's interior. So um, the mantle is made of magma. And when it comes out, it's going to be called lava. And that is molten rock. Okay, That's an igneous rock. So you can have a fissure, which is basically like a crack in the Earth where, where magma will spout and, and flow out and become lava. Magma is what we call it when it's inside the Earth, and lava is... Um, on the outside of the world, uh, outside of the Earth, um, take a look at some different volcanic activities. Um, you can also look up like Mount St. Helens in the in the eighties. Um, there can be benefits of volcanic activity. It's going to form new rock, um, and and it'll it'll build up the Earth. So we'll talk in class more about benefits of volcanic activity. So volcanoes can form in a couple different places. They can form in a subduction zone where plates are coming together. They can form what looks like in the middle of nowhere, like Hawaii. Hawaii look, is like in the middle of nowhere, it seems, like in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Well, you can have what we call hot spots, where magma just is very, very, very hot in that area and will cause like upwelling of the magma. It will go up and it will be very hot. Um, and then it will just punch through the lithosphere and and go through onto the 
um, Earth's crust. And these little hot spots start off as just sort of magma and lava shooting out into the ocean, cooling, breaking through that rock, shooting out and cooling. And over thousands and thousands of years, that will build up into this giant mountain and form a volcano. Um, Hawaii's volcanoes are not like the kind where you're like, boom, explosion, Pompeii. They're more of a slow-flowing volcano where they're very active, um, but but it's more of like magma and lava is going to come out and form new crust constantly. If you look at the Hawaiian Islands and the way they go, like the, the ones that are farther to the west um, are older. That's because the, the plate has been moving over this hot spot. And eventually, in several thousand years, there's going to be a new Hawaiian island with a new volcano on it. It's just going to take that much time for it to build up and form. Um, so these and some of the other Hawaiian islands are actually extinct volcanoes. They moved off of that hot spot and they were formed by a volcano, but they're not going to erupt it ever again, most likely. I would say almost definitely, but um, the only thing about that is they'll be weathered and eroded, so over time they will go away and be just kind of bumps under the ocean until they maybe aren't anything anymore. So another really awesome example of um, geologic activity are earthquakes which around here, apparently there was an earthquake not that long ago. I did not feel it. Um, I I felt like very minor earthquakes before, and I think like the, the air conditioning turning on almost was more intense with shaking the building than any earthquake I've personally experienced. Um, the last earthquake I experienced, I was at home in Buffalo, and I lived in an upstairs apartment. I have two fat cats. And... I thought my big fat cat had jumped off of like a table or off of something on the floor and had, and had shaken the apartment a little bit, except it kept shaking. And I was like, oh, cool, an earthquake, um, which, you know, in our area of the earth, we can kind of think, oh, cool, an earthquake, because it probably won't be damaging to us. Whereas in other parts of earth, earthquakes can be very damaging and devastating. Um, I'll show you guys some videos to show like, how people create architecture that allows for um, like some movement so that way they can not fall over during an earthquake. So when we talk about earthquakes, we want to talk about seismic waves. There's P and S waves. What the focus is, the epicenter, magnitude, amplitude. I encourage you to look this up in your book, write some of these things down, make a diagram for yourself. I want to show you a diagram, um, but that way you know what all these things are. So when it's mentioned, you're, you're not looking up what is this again how do i what what um what we use to measure earthquake activity is called the richter scale anything four or less is considered insignificant um and what's interesting about the richter scale as you go up one number um the magnitude increases by 10. so a magnitude five earthquake is 10 times stronger than a four and a six is a hundred times stronger than a four so you can see as you go up in the scale that these can be devastating and humongous so um, the largest on record was 9.5 in Chile in the 60s, or 1960. Devastating, devastatingly strong. Okay? These earthquakes can, and volcanoes can be very powerful, like earth processes can be extremely powerful, catastrophic. So um, let me see if I've got that. Oh, yeah, I've got it bigger. So I'm going to talk about this in a second. But um, after an earthquake, you can see the damage to to buildings, to civilizations. It's terrible. Um, and it's you, they're not really something you can predict. We know where about earthquakes are likely to occur, but we're not really able to predict, hey, in two weeks there's going to be an earthquake, so everyone needs to get ready. You can't. We just can't yet. So those things I talked about, here's a focus. A focus is like the area inside the earth where the we would say that the earthquake originated from. Um, and how that's connected to the epicenter, the epicenter is the area directly above the focus on the surface of the earth. So we can call this the epicenter of the earthquake. So what do what happens after an earthquake happens? So let's look right here at what causes an earthquake. So here we have two tectonic plates and they're moving in some way relative to each other, across each other, towards each other, away from each other, um, 
with mountains there, I assume that they're moving towards each other. Um, so we end up with the initial movement, and then we end up with shock waves that kind of ripple back and forth throughout the Earth, um, which can be called like an aftershock. And so you can have many of those, um, and they can be stronger than the original earthquake waves. So um, you have your shock waves that kind of will ripple out. You can kind of see like a, like if you threw a stone into a pond, okay, you can kind of see it's like that. Um, in order to determine the, the focus in the epicenter, by the way, um, there are um, Richter scales, like, like earthquake detection scales all over, all over the world. And so by figuring out the time difference from the start of the wave, you're able to triangulate and pinpoint an area where the, the epicenter is. So what could happen just from an earthquake? Landslides. So um, you can get uh, liquefaction, that's a fun word, of sediments, um, which means like if I took like a, a bunch of like dirt and mud and started shaking it, it, it could start behaving like a liquid, which how is a building supposed to stand up on a liquid? So like if there's like gravel and loose stuff, it's going to shake and like almost not really it will liquefy, but liquefaction. Okay, so it can cause sinkholes to appear. Um, any loose rocks and stuff or mud can whoop, slide right down the mountain. Um, it can cause flooding in low-lying areas depending on, we'll get to this soon, but depending on where the focus and the epicenter is, if it's in the ocean, it could potentially cause a tsunami. Um, Yay! So, um, when we look at the earthquake risk in the United States, we get kind of a picture of where fault lines are. So we talked about San Andreas Fault. It's here. Okay, so they're at a great earthquake, earthquake risk because they are on a fault. So there are some like older faults all over here, but um, yeah, we're we're all right. We're not really in a, a big risk for earthquakes. Clearly, we had one, so we can get them, but um, we're not in a huge risk area. Now, when we look at the world, take a minute to like pause while I get a drink of water and look at the world earthquake risk. If we overlaid this with a picture of Earth's tectonic plates, you would see where plates are or where earthquakes are occurring. Remember I pointed out to you the India plate and the Eurasian plate are crashing into each other right here. Um, the Arabian plate is also crashing into the Eurasian plate here. So there's a really large risk for earthquakes. Same thing here. We have plates moving here and on this side of the earth. In fact, when we don't have this as our center um, and we shift the earth, we actually consider this area and this area connected is the ring of fire because we see lots of earthquakes and volcanoes in that area and sort of like a ring. Johnny Cash. Okay, so if there's an earthquake on the ocean floor, they can cause a huge wave called a tsunami. It's a Japanese word. Um, so um, you, it might also be called a tidal wave. They are very fast moving. They can travel at hundreds of miles per hour. Sort of like the plate has moved whoop, like away from each other and like a ton of like water you can imagine rushed into this little opening. So it's like, oh, we like the the ocean level didn't drop, but the ocean has to flow into that spot to even back out. Okay, it would be like if I had a um like a container and I made a small opening, all the water is going to rush into that opening until it's even again. Um, it's, it doesn't look like a hole in the ocean or anything like that, but, but you can kind of imagine it that way. Or there's such like a, a sudden movement, it's going to cause a wave. Well, that wave doesn't look like a whole lot if it's in the middle of the ocean because the ocean is so deep. But as you get closer and closer to, <clears throat> excuse me, as you get closer and closer to land, However, um, we're getting shallower and shallower and shallower. And so that's going to cause this wave to look larger and larger and larger. Um, so we have tsunami detectors. There's, there are buoys out in the open ocean. And if they drop or rise a certain amount, they'll send an alert about a tsunami. And if there's like an earthquake alert that comes in as well, 
people can know and, and detect it before it hits land. Um, there was a huge tsunami in the Indian Ocean in, in 2004, magnitude 9.15. That is a humongous earthquake. Um, and it caused 31 meter high waves at the shore. Um, just converting to American units, try to get familiar with metric units, by the way, but converting that into American units, that's like 93 feet, almost 100 foot high waves. So you'd have to be like in a building that's got more than 10 stories just to be above water. Um, so um, coral reefs and, and mangroves, which grow in like the, the estuary type areas, which can get salt in fresh water, help to like diminish the amount of just wave that comes and smacks onto the land, which is one of a zillion reasons why we want to keep our wetlands, why we want to keep our coral reefs, why we want to keep these mangroves. Let me show you some pictures. Um, so see here how this plate moved and we have oh, like the water had to fill in this little gap here. Um, so it's going to form a wave. Um, and so the waves are going to move upward and it's not going to be that humongous in the open ocean. But as you get closer, this doesn't do it justice to show, but as you get closer and closer and closer to the shore, however, this wave is going to get larger and larger and larger. So this is in your notes. You can take time to like read about this or read these things. Um, there's lots of other things I can show you about tsunamis. And this is just a closer up look at that. If you want to pause and read any of those things that are up there. Oh, and this is the one that particularly happened in 2004. This is where the earthquake um, epicenter was. And so damage happened to all of these countries. I want you to take a minute just to look at the before and after. Um, this is in Indonesia. So this is a before and after of the tsunami. You can see how utterly destructive these things are. Um, and it will take a long time for the water to recede from these areas, especially if they're low-lying coastal areas. They might not immediately um, recover. Um, and you can see, like, you know, there's trees and, like, buildings and stuff in here. It's just, like, like nothing. Okay. Um, more recent. Um, this is the – I didn't title it. Sorry. And it's not the best picture, but here's the before and after. This is the Fukushima – I'm going to say it wrong, but Daiichi – nuclear power plant. Um, so there was an earthquake and a tsunami that happened near Fukushima, Japan. Oh my gosh. I, I want to say 2011, 2012. I have to look it up now. Sorry. I just looked at the picture. I didn't look at the year. Um, and the reason why this particular tsunami was significant, um, Japan gets hit with earthquake because of the tectonic plates that are there. But um, this was not in the greatest area. It like kind of affected a nuclear power plant, which caused the release of some nuclear waste into the surrounding area. Not good. So kind of bringing that idea back to sustainability and stewardship of the environment, you can kind of imagine the effect that lots of nuclear waste would have on the ocean and on the, the I mean, it's traveling through the air. Um, so this area in Japan had to quickly be abandoned. Okay. So that's all I want to talk to you about for right now. Um, we can talk about the rock cycle later. I think this is long enough, and I just wanted to cover um, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, and plate tectonics. So I hope that helps you understand and get an idea about that. Next, we'll talk about rocks, rock cycles, soil, soil formation, all that great stuff. So I hope this helps you understand and helps put into a little bit better perspective what you're reading about. And I will see you soon.